Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's OTS webinar. Uh, we're going to get started now. So today our speaker is Matt Stanton, and he's from Generation Bio. So he's a chemist by training. Uh, he's worked at uh, Moderna. He's worked at Merck as well. Um, but he's kind of worked in almost every therapeutic area with every therapeutic modality. He has really broad experience. Um, and he's talking to us today about non-viral DNA delivery opportunities and challenges. But he also uh, mentioned when we were kind of chatting before that he'd be happy to answer kind of career questions as well. So as he's going through his talk, if you have any questions, you can um, ask them in the Q&A function. Uh, and then at the end, we'll curate a question period, and you're welcome to ask any sorts of questions that you'd like as well there. So I'm going to pass uh, it over to Matt to get started. Thank you, Aaron. Um, and thank you for the invitation to give this webinar. Um, I'm really thrilled at the opportunity to talk about nonviral DNA delivery and potentially for this audience, shine a little light on something that um, you probably have heard less about in OTF and other nucleic acid therapeutics um, uh, forums which is non-viral DNA or non-viral gene therapy. Um, so Aaron gave a, a wonderful introduction. I would say, I think about my career as kind of split between my early days at Merck and Small Molecules and the fateful decision in 2008, which I'll never forget, was the year my first son was born, um, moving into siRNA at Merck, um, and then ultimately uh, mRNA at Moderna, and now DNA at Generation Bio. And one of the Kind of commonalities of that 15-year journey for me has been the use of lipid nanoparticle technology and delivery in general from nucleic acids. Um, so while I've done a lot of different things, I seem to have been unable to escape lipid nanoparticles uh, as a delivery modality for nucleic acids. And it's been interesting to see the renaissance of that in the world of mRNA vaccines and now gene editing and, and what I'm hoping to bring you up to speed on in terms of non-viral DNA delivery. So why do we care? First of all, I have housekeeping. Um, sorry, one second. Uh, Forward-looking statements. Generation Bio is a public company, and this is just my reminder that uh, anything I say here um, falls under forward-looking statements. What is it in the world that we're really trying to bring forward with non-viral DNA delivery? And I've used this not to be exhaustive by any means, but representative of kind of the world and evolution of nucleic acid or genetic medicines over the last uh, 15, 20 years. Um, and thinking about l -Nylum on the left side of this as a representative company in the space of siRNA therapeutics, um, that really did was kind of the, the dawn of, in many ways, of uh, genetic medicines. And what l -Nylum was able to bring forward with their Galnet conjugate uh, technology was redosability and durability. So these are typically now twice yearly type doses in the space of loss of function, meaning knockdown of, en of endogenous genes, um, which is a very important modality uh, that, you know, in terms of being able to treat disease and, and has just um, racked up some profound successes in the clinic in that space. Um, when I moved to Moderna, what attracted me right out of the gate was the ability to switch from loss of function to gain of function for this ability to express protein um, any protein of interest by, by administering the genetic code, if you will, for that protein. And it shared with al -Nylum this idea of redosability and, and scale and uh, uh, industrialization of like a real drug modality. The challenge with mRNA to date has really been the transient nature of the effects of uh, mRNA. It's a short-lived molecule. And so the, the expression of protein is relatively short-lived. Now, in applications where you're trying to drive paracrine effects, like vaccine applications where you're expressing an antigen, it's actually found obviously a very nice utility there. We're all very aware of that. And it's developing towards therapeutic applications, but the attraction at Generation Bio was really bringing forward the gain of function and redosability, but layering in the durability that's seen with alnylam or other gene therapies but in this um, non-viral space. So without all the limitations of relying on a virus, which right now for DNA delivery is kind of the state of the art clinically, is using AAV or other viral applications to deliver DNA. And that sweeps in a whole uh, mess of uh, challenges in terms of manufacturing and cost, single dose immunogenicity, um, you name it. So we really are, have this vision of creating a non-viral DNA-based um, platform. 
Um, and so that's all well and good. Um, I think it's very easy to see the attractiveness of what that could bring to patients um, if you could you could uh, solve that that problem. But what is it that you need to kind of address to actually make that a reality? And I think there are um, really three scientific problems that must be addressed, um, starting with innate immunity. Um, so DNA, like other nucleic acid cargos, can elicit a strong innate immune stimulation in immune cells, which can limit tolerability, can also play a role in the induction of antiviral defenses that may limit protein expression. That's common with all of the RNA platforms that I just mentioned, and I'll come on to that in a little bit. You need to solve delivery, and in the context of DNA, I'll, I'll walk through some examples of this where that may be a bit different than the challenges faced um, with RNA. And in fact, I'll walk through very explicitly how delivery and innate immunity can be uh, intimately tied together. Um, I'd also point out that delivery as it stands, particularly for large nucleic acid cargos uh, like mRNA or DNA, um, the ability to move beyond the liver still requires novel solutions. So I'll tee that up a little bit too, how we're thinking about moving beyond uh, delivery just to the liver. And finally for DNA, a very specific uh, aspect of DNA delivery is nuclear access. Most of the target tissues we wanna go after are non-dividing post-mitotic cells. And the nuclear envelope is a barrier to DNA delivery. And it so happens that most non-viral delivery systems really get you as far as the cytoplasm of a cell. And so you really have to traverse that last mile, so to speak, and have DNA um, enter the nucleus. And that's a relatively poorly understood area. So when I started at Generation Bio six years ago, this was kind of the framework of the challenges that, that stood before us. So let's talk a little bit about innate immunity in the context of DNA and in the context of delivery. And I'll start by saying like, unlike RNA platforms, we really started from a place where there were no known solutions at the DNA level for innate immunity. So what I'm showing on the left is if you compare an empty lipid nanoparticle to one that contains DNA, you can see the DNA lipid nanoparticle elicits a very strong cytokine response. This is six hours post-administration in a mouse where you're getting up to thousands of picograms per mil of interferon alpha. And that's true for, for a host of cytokines and chemokines. In the space of um, siRNA and messenger RNA, lots of elegant work to solve innate immune challenges at the chemical level, at the cargo level. So for siRNA, two prime ribose modifications, in particular two prime methyl, shown to inhibit TLR type responses or innate immune activation of siRNA. In messenger RNA, it really was uridine chemical modifications and purity that laid that laid the foundation for the ability to avoid innate immune triggering there. And of course, this is very timely. Um, just last week, um, uh, Katie Carrico and Drew Weissman won the Nobel Prize uh, for this exact discovery in the case of mRNA. And I'm pulling this straight from the, uh, from the Nobel Prize website. Um, you can see what the prize was for, but the first description and figure is the, is the characterization of unmodified mRNA versus base modified, pseudouridine modified, mRNA and the ability to dampen this inflammatory response that arises um, from unmodified RNA. So in just taking it one step uh, further, this was a paper we published at Moderna. We spent a lot of time looking at the influence of chemistry and manufacturing process on innate immune activation. And I'll walk you through this data a little bit. Um, just to say what I love about this is it takes it a step beyond the initial discovery of chemical modifications and really starts to hone in on what is it you're actually putting in a vial. So in the left figure here, if we just focus on process A for now, um, on this left figure, what you're looking at is the amount of double-stranded RNA impurities contained within a batch of RNA that's, that's generated through a T7 polymerase reaction. And for both uridine, uh, natural uridine, or the one methyl pseudouridine modified, you can see these very low levels of double-stranded impurities, about 0.35%. Uh, weight volume uh, impurity there. And the significance of that um, on the far right here is the induction of interferon beta, particularly in the unmodified uridine, but some, some amount even with the uridine modified. Um, and then in the middle is, is ex expression. So you can see on the far left here, um, the uridine unmodified that has, an immune, that has the impurities and a strong interferon beta response leads to very minimal protein expression, but if you modify that 
and dampen down this innate immune profile, you can really drive high protein expression. And so, again, that's really the basis of the Nobel Prize that was awarded. Um, what was interesting about this is we spent a lot of time focused on process to how to make higher quality uh, um, messenger RNA just through process modifications in the T7 polymerase reaction. And you can see here that through those process optimization, you can really start to limit the amount of double-stranded impurities in both cases, minimize the interferon beta response. And you start to rescue expression with the unmodified uridine, but I would say the one methyl pseudo U is still best in terms of protein expression. So again, lots of value to taking early academic uh, work and really industrializing it to uh, something that's measurable and reproducible in terms of you know, what it is ultimately you're putting into patients. So that's a little bit of the RNA story, but back to where we are with DNA, I mentioned this interplay between delivery and innate immunity. In the world of RNA, where you can chemically modify the RNA to uh, minimize the response, this type of distribution pattern is not uh, significantly problematic. So typical kind of traditional lipid nanoparticles really are distributed to two main tissues, hepatocytes in the liver and phagocytic populations, both systemically and, and predominantly in the spleen. And there are many mechanisms for this off-target delivery to the myeloid cells of the spleen. And we know very well that APOE mediates the trafficking to hepatocytes. So the consequence of that, when you take an, uh, an experiment where you're injecting high levels of nucleic acid cargo in kind of a standard LMP um, in CD1 mice, you can see here, right? So uh, mRNA behaves very much like the PBS treated animals with nominal baseline levels of interferon alpha and IL-6. But for the DNA containing LMP, you see this high level of stimulation that I alluded to earlier. Um, what we went and realized, and this is the intersection between innate immunity and delivery, was that the cells we care about, hepatocytes in the liver, actually don't have and don't express DNA sensing uh, uh, machinery. And so this comes from literature around the characterization of hepatitis B virus infection, showing that when you actually isolate the cells in the liver, uh, the Cooper cells have high levels of sting, but the, the hepatocytes actually are devoid of sting, which is one of the key signaling pathways for DNA innate immunity. And so that when you transfect hepatocytes, you actually don't see a strong interferon response or, or cytokine stimulation. Um, and this led us to the hypothesis that if we could selectively deliver DNA to hepatocytes, but avoid the immune cells, we could actually significantly reduce this innate immune stimulation. So that's the intersection between delivery and innate immunity for DNA. We really set out to create a, a more exquisite selective delivery system um, for our DNA cargo. And so a first generation approach really was about maintaining the APOE mediated trafficking on the left side of this um, slide with potentially adding in GALMAC for ASGPR mediated hepatic targeting. But how can we reduce the off-target clearance into the cells that we know are driving this innate immunity. And one of the things we, we realized early on was that our cargo for DNA is a linear B-form double-stranded DNA. I'm showing a um, atomic force microscopy image on the left here. Um, this may prefer extended conformations of relatively rigid mo molecule. And one of the things we noticed early on was that when we played with different compositional elements of lipid nanoparticles to try and decrease the particle size. Um, it didn't behave as well with the Sedna containing LMPs as it did for more flexible, small nucleic acid cargo. And I'm showing here on the right, um, poly A. So this is short poly A RNA cargo. And just as an example, if you increase the peg percentage you can drop the particle size from around 70 nanometers to around 50 nanometers quite easily. And that's well known for siRNA and other types of nucleic acid cargo. But we were intrigued that when we tried the same trick of increasing peg percentage for Sedna, we were stuck around this 70, 80 nanometer um, particle size. Now going back to, I'll just go back a slide in terms of what does that have to do with reducing off target clearance, we, we long hypothesized that smaller is better and more homogeneous is better for eliminating these phagocytic type of uh, events that drive off target clearance. So we asked the question, are there ways that we can create smaller lipid nanoparticles with DNA cargo 
um, and see if that actually helps with our liver to um, spleen distribution favoring liver in our on-target cell population and increase the overall therapeutic index of our, our drug product by doing so. So um, anecdotally, it's, it's worth saying we, we started this, this goes back a couple of years. So right at the start of the pandemic, so we were in March, April of 2020, we were shutting down the lab uh, to try and figure out how are we gonna work through the pandemic and what's the, the protocol. And I know, I remember specifically, we had a few weeks um, really downtime at home. And what was interesting about that time was we said, let's go really just dig into the literature and think about this particular problem. What are ways that we might be able to alter the structure even in, in a transient manner to try and uh, produce smaller particle sizes, um, but maintaining high encapsulation efficiency. And one of our scientists really stumbled into a bunch of very old 1960s, 1970s type of um, very esoteric literature around the structure of DNA and the ability to denature the molecule. So we typically think of DNA as a molecule that you use ethanol to precipitate from aqueous solution as a purification method. But what these guys were doing were, were looking at ways to desalt DNA and then denature it into alcohol solvents and study the effect of that, that denaturation. So um, they, were, they were able to do this. They were able to essentially solubilize DNA, linear or plasma DNA into 100% ethanol. And they started to observe interesting structural effects there that they coined P-form DNA. And what this was in reference to uh, kind of tongue in cheek was Linus Pauling's predicted structure of DNA, which was famously wrong, um, which was that the nucleobases were unpaired and the phosphates were actually inter uh, internalized in, uh, in the interior of the helix and forming hydrogen bonds within the phosphate-phosphate interactions. And so it looks a little bit like this on the, on the left-hand side, B-form DNA that we're all familiar with. You dehydrate that into ethanol, you create this kind of condensed or collapsed P form of the DNA, which is much more flexible. It doesn't have the same rigidity as a helical structure, a typical helical structure. And that shows up on the bottom micrograph there where they're able to show that you can get these kind of condensed spheroid molecules of DNA in this ethanolic solution. So we asked the question um, at this time, before we even got back in the lab, what if we could dehydrate our closed end of DNA molecule? into ethanolic lip LMP input streams with the lipids that we're gonna create the LMP with and actually see if that is able to create smaller and more homogeneous lipid nanoparticles. Um, and just a reminder of how lipid nanoparticles are made, you typically have your nucleic acid in your aqueous stream and aqueous buffer and your lipids that are formed the basis of the shell of the lipid nanoparticle in the ethanol stream. And you team mix that under really vigorous conditions or you microfluidic mix that um, to create these, uh, these really small lipid nanoparticles. We were just asking the question, what if we put the, the DNA into the ethanol stream? Um, so the aqueous buffer is just, just aqueous buffer, not, no nucleic acid cargo. And right away when we went back into the lab and tried this first experiment out of the gate, it actually worked beautifully. So what I'm showing on the top here in blue is our standard process and size distribution if we have the DNA in the aqueous stream. You'll notice that this is a, a DLS curve, so size intensity, um, and you'll notice it's centered around 100 nanometers and a, and a bit broader, so that's the, homo the, the uh, heterogeneity profile or polydispersity index. But in the cases where we did red and, red and green are two different replicates of putting the DNA into the ethanolic stream creating this kind of P-form DNA that's condensed and then generating the particles. You can see a left shift in the particle size, so they're smaller and the polydispersity is, is better. The peak sharpens up quite a bit. We confirmed this through looking at some of the cryo-EM images of, of this material on the bottom here. And you can see for the standard um, method of producing these, we often ended up with these kind of multimeric like bled structures that were very large and unstructured. Now, when we did the P-form process, we got very uniform particles, high density uh, and uniform uh, lipid nanoparticles, which is what we were really setting out to do. So, okay, we did that. We were successful in creating smaller particles. Now we have the ability to test our hypothesis. 
what happens when we take these particles into mice in vivo? And what is the profile relative to where we started? And we're really excited to see this data. This is a study in, in wild type mice dosed uh, IV at 0.25 mix per kg. Um, the LMP compositions are the exact are identical in terms of the lipid compositions, same lot of closed ended DNA. But you can see just by making this process change and controlling the size and distribution of the particles, um, we get a better expression, uh, nominally better expression, durable as we expect off of DNA platform. But you can see the interferon alpha levels go down significantly. Um, and we were able to confirm when we looked at the copies in the liver to spleen that that correlated with a higher liver, liver to spleen ratio with the smaller particles. So about 30 to one liver to spleen ratio, which is a significant improvement over where we started. So that was pretty exciting. I think it led us to the ability to generate data like this, now getting out of a luciferase reporter construct into a, a gene cassette that's therapeutically relevant. This is factor eight. So our lead program is in hemophilia A. And this is um, dose response data on the left in a sanguine mouse model. So this is expressing human factor eight in a mouse model that's um, genetically tolerized for the human uh, protein. So you can look at durability of expression in this model. And you can see a nice dose response up to two mg per kg where we're getting supra physiological levels. So greater than 100% of uh, plasma factor eight levels, 100% of normal. In the same experiment, we did this, this is the real attractiveness of non-viral systems, is the animals that didn't respond at the lower doses, we took, we split those cohorts and gave half of them a second dose at a higher one mg per kg uh, level at about 30 days. And this is what you can see here, we boosted them into the therapeutic range. So even though they're wild type mice and they have a full immune system, you can redose them and titrate them into a therapeutic range. Um, that's something you can't do with AAV and viral systems because of the uh, antibodies generated to capsid. And so this is what we're really attracted to, this type of profile to be able to do this clinically ultimately for patients and titrate everybody into a, a therapeutic range, even if they don't get there on the first dose. So moving along, we started to think about second generation uh, lipid nanoparticles with even further improvements in selectivity of, of distribution and to do this, we go back to this cartoon of how LMPs are distributed between liver and off target. And we said, we asked ourselves, what if we could shut down all of the inherent endogenous distribution? So typically lipid nanoparticles, when they're dosed, they pick up proteins and those proteins really dictate their distribution to different cell populations. But what if we could take stealth, create stealth LMPs that didn't deliver naturally to, uh, to, to these different tissues? and instead stayed in circulation in the blood, and then redirect them to the tissues we care about, starting with liver, but with much greater selectivity by adding an active targeting ligand. And of course, we started with Galinac in the liver, well known uh, to this audience, certainly care, uh, ligand for hepatic distribution through uh, the ASGP receptor. Um, the, the trick of this, I would say, uh, and I don't show this here, but the real critical element of being able to do this effectively for lipid nanoparticles is you want to create a stealth lipid nanoparticle that maintains its pH-dependent endosomal escape properties when it does get to the cell type of choice once you target it. And so that's where we spent a lot of time focused on compositional optimization to kind of check all of those boxes. And we started, if we think about the first step is like, how do you create stealth particles? We set up a series of, of assays in vitro to look at the consequence of uptake into different cell populations when incubated with serum. Um, and I'm showing here data in macrophages. These are THP1 human monocytes that have been differentiated into phagocytic macrophages. ARPE19 cells are a, um, a retinal cell that uh, is, upregulates LDL receptors. So it's another pathway, a surrogate for even hepatic distribution. LSECs are another uh, scavenger type of, these are liver sinusoidal endothelial cells that can take up material in the sinusoids. And then finally, hepatocytes. And in this case, we don't want to get uptake into hepatocytes with the base stealth until we target it. So this is all work with non-targeted stealth lipid nanoparticles. And you can see that we were able to identify compositions that reduced uptake in these, significantly reduced uptake into these cell populations across the board. 
So that set the stage for um, going in vivo and asking, can we relate that to blood PK? Because what we're, again, really asking ourselves is can we create stealth particles that stay in circulation long enough to be retargeted to other cell populations? And I'm showing a series of so-called stealth particles one through five, compositionally different based on their, their lipid content. And you can see a range of stealth properties in terms of the, the stealth one uh, LMP is obviously cleared the fastest, stealth five the slowest. And that correlates with hepatic uptake and primary hepatocytes where stealth five shows the the lowest amount of uptake into primary hepatocytes. So this is how we've characterized compositions aimed at creating stealth properties that allows us to go back in and then add the targeting ligand, in this case, Galnac, as I said, to drive hepatic extraction. So what I'm showing on the left is in blue is the stealth profile without the Galnac. In green is the stealth lipid nanoparticle where we've added the Galnac lipid to the surface to drive hepatic extraction. And in red is an APOE-driven LMP control, which has very rapid extraction. We can see that the Galnac targeted is somewhere in between stealth and an APOE control. Importantly, the copies that are delivered to the liver are quite comparable between the stealth plus Galnac and the APOE LMP control. And just as importantly, and this is really critical, as I mentioned at the outset, you have to maintain the endosomal pool properties. And what we're showing here is we certainly do that. The stealth plus Galnac is expressing um, equal to, if not better than the APOE mediated LMP control. And now further uh, characterization of the tolerability profile, moving from that gen one uh, example I gave with the P-form DNA, um, that's really shown here in the APOE LMP control where we can get to now two mg per kg reasonably well. But with the stealth plus Galnac, we see a further diminishing of the cytokine profile because our selectivity is even that much better. We're further reducing the off-target by maintaining the on-target activity and expanding our therapeutic index. So really excited to see this profile mature and, and provide proof of concept for the idea of control of biodistribution as a means of, of mediating the uh, innate immune um, response. We then turned our attention to um, moving beyond Galnac. Galnac's a great molecule, particularly in the context of oligoconjugates. But it does have some off-target activity. So if you look at CD301 as a, a representative off-target lectin receptor versus the human ASGPR, tri or tetragalnac clusters can have high affinity for ASGPR, but they also have high affinity for CD301. Now it's a bit theoretical what the consequence of that might be, but we set out to identify ligands that actually have better selectivity for ASGPR and leave behind the off-target lectin. And we reasoned the best way to do that was to go into um, fragment antibody, antibody types of formats that are not sugar-based uh, targeting ligands. So we started with, uh, uh, we found an SCFB ligand that has high affinity for ASGPR, but no binding to CD, CD301. It's a really great selectivity. Um, I'm glossing over just a ton of work here in terms of how do you move from a sugar-based targeting ligand to a protein-based targeting ligand, but suffice it to say, We've invested a lot in how to conjugate these SCFB molecules to the surface of our lipid nanoparticles and characterize those in vitro. I'm showing here the SCFB for ASGPR showing very high levels of uptake and expression with mRNA cargo in this example um, in primary hepatocytes relative to an isotype control. So the isotype control is actually trastuzumab and trastuzumab, an anti-HER SCFB that um, yeah, you know, that's not expressed in, in liver of, of normal wild type animals. And Galnac control is down here. So we're actually seeing a boost in vitro and expression in primary pedicides versus the Galnac uh, cluster. And we have moved these, um, these types of LMPs in vivo. Now back to Sedna DNA cargo, you can see that there's a background level of expression with the parent LMP. It's pretty low in the 10 to the seven total flux range. And we boost on that about a two log increase in expression by adding the SCFB. Um, we do have the trastuzumab controls in here too, and they look like parent LMP. So everything's controlled well, very specific on target activity, high levels of expression. You can even see in the mice here. So that's um, where we are with, uh, with our liver directed CTLMP. So stealth plus targeting for CTLMP. Um, molecules or LMPs that uh, can go to the liver, we're very interested in exploring the ability to take the stealth LMPs, 
Now, going back to protein type targets, but ligands directed at other cell types beyond the liver to see if we can move uh, this type of profile into different cell types. So stay tuned for that. We'll have much more to say about that in the future. Um, but suffice it to say, lots of other people, I want to give a shout out to the work that's happening in the field in this space. I think the interest in extra hepatic delivery through lipid nanoparticle is really starting to ratchet up. I show three examples here. James Dolman's lab at Emory uh, has developed this barcoding approach. So it's a very empirical approach for how do you screen many, many lipid nanoparticle types of compositions at once in a small number of animals. And this is an example where they've been able to develop uh, LNPs that are preferential for Cooper cells in the liver versus hepatocytes. So very interesting kind of swap and selectivity that you typically see for, for LNPs into Cooper cells. Um, Dan Seward at, uh, at, um, uh, uh, at Texas is working um, uh, at these sort LNP. So what, what Dan and his group has done is adding in a fifth lipid component to control the surface properties of LNPs. And they call these sort lipids. So in this particular case, um, in this publication, they're adding an anionic lipid which redirects the, the formulations away from the liver and into the spleen with high specificity. And you can see the distribution um, again here, the total luminescence away from um, liver with a normal LMP that's neutral to spleen uh, expression, predominant spleen expression when you have the anionic LMP. Um, increasing statistically the delivery to T cells in vivo. Um, and also a number of other cells within the spleen, predominantly macrophages, not surprisingly with anionic particles, you get a lot of macrophage uptake. Um, but going after that, and you can imagine applications in, in the world of in vivo CAR-T, and that's exactly what Drew Weissman and um, Hamida Paris have also developed our anti-CD5 ligand targeted LNPs for T-cell delivery in vivo, thinking about doing things like in vivo CAR-T, and they've shown some promising early data in this publication using these targeted lipid nanoparticles to direct um, material into T cells. Um, the difference between what we're doing and what uh, Weissman and, and Varghese are doing is they're adding the targeting ligand as best we can tell on, on kind of a non cell based lipid nanoparticle. But I think there's still a lot of LMP in this system that ends up in liver and spleen. Um, and work to do to kind of continue to redistribute that, but a very promising start in the context of in vivo uh, CAR-T delivery. So we're going into the same kind of places. We really are uh, um, encouraged by the approach of starting with a foundational stealth lipid nanoparticle, developing the ability to conjugate various types of ligands to the surface of those particles with high um, scalability and robustness, and thinking very much about ligand biology, small format ligand discovery and panning for ligands of various targets. We announced back in March a collaboration with Moderna, and that's exactly what we're doing there with them right now, is focused on delivery of these stealth LNPs through active targeting to various immune cells. And internally at Generation Bio, we're also thinking about taking it to this to other cell populations. And again, we'll have more to say that on that in the future, but you can imagine directing uh, with this profile of systemic circulation and availability, directing these particles to other cell types of interest. So I know um, that's a lot on delivery and innate immunity and in what we've been working on, uh, including extra hepatic delivery. I wanna come back to the third barrier that I mentioned for DNA, which is nuclear access. And probably just introduce the molecule we've been working for, maybe late introduce it late in the conversation, but we've, I've mentioned this, this molecule closed into DNA. Well, what exactly is that? It's a molecule that was discovered by Rob Cotton, our scientific founder. He's working in the uh, SF9 manufacturing system for AAV gen, uh, gene therapy. And he found a way to, to get those cells to produce what he called closed into DNA, um, absent capsid. So it's just DNA. And where we started was making this material in this cell-based system the cartoon of it is up here. It's, it contains the inverted terminal repeat structures that are inherent in AAV, but it's a, a linear double-stranded uh, fully complementary molecule with closed ends, covalently closed ends. And right out of the gate, what, Robert, uh, what Rob understood was that and identified was that these molecules, which they originally called sealant, um, express better in cell culture than plasmid uh, 
uh, DNA. And so that was really the generation, the genesis of Generation Bio in terms of the, the DNA construct we've been working with. And what we like about it is that it starts to um, really address this foundational issue of nuclear access. So another experiment that Rob ran is on the left here, where he compared in myocytes and using microinjection. So it's a bit tedious, but you go in and microinject into every cell, either in the nucleus or the cytoplasm, the DNA of interest. And right off the bat, you can see with, with traditional plasmid uh, that expresses GFP, if you microinject into the nucleus, all the cells turn positive. You're directing it to the cell, the place where it needs to be. But if you microinject into the cytoplasm, essentially zero are positive for GFP expression. That's the influence of the nuclear barrier. If you take a plasmid construct and you engineer in the ITR sequences flanking the gene of interest, you interestingly start to see a little uptake. So just inclusion of those ITR sequences, and they're probably not structured as they are in the cartoon here, um, but those sequences start to drive uh, increased nuclear access. But when you have a full uh, Sedna-type molecule with the fully structured ITRs and a linear molecule, you really start to see a significant boost in accessing the nucleus and, and GFP-positive expression. We've seen this in vivo as well. So here on the right is showing a, a sectioned liver stained with ish probes for closed-ended DNA, six hours post-administration in the mouth. And I've circled the nuclei here where you can see the positive uh, signal of copies within the nucleus you know, ranging anywhere from, you know, a few to the 10 or so copies per nuclei. That increases in a dose-dependent manner, so we can use uh, software that actually quantifies this, the percent of hepatocytes that are positive for nuclear signal um, in a dose-dependent manner. Um, we've also seen this impact of, of the closed-ended DNA molecule relative to plasmid in vivo. We see it in expression, so I'm showing on the left here about a log increase in expression. Um, with Sedna relative to plasmid and a better tolerability, presumably because we're, we're getting less residence time in the cytoplasm and actually accessing the nuclear nucleus uh, more quickly, but they're better overall better tolerated in terms of acute body weight change as well for closed into DNA. Now, I wouldn't say that this is a solved problem by any stretch. Um, the, we're still very actively engaged in continuing to try and to optimize the percentage of copies that get to the cytoplasm that can make it to the nucleus of, of uh, post-mitotic cells. There's also a ton of literature in this space. Um, and I've, I've tried to give a balanced approach here of some of the things that we've seen that are interesting that seem to show meaningful impact on nuclear uh, access. One over here, Jean-Paul Baer and his lab uh, had developed the ability to really beautiful chemistry to to conjugate a nuclear localization signal, uh, signal peptide to the end of a linear DNA molecule, a capped linear DNA molecule. And you can see for the, the mutant NLS versus the actual NLS, you get a nice, and versus a plasmid, you get a nice boost in the overall intensity of uh, expression early and, and durably in cell culture. Um, um, uh, David Dean and his group have also looked at DTS inclusion. These are DNA targeting sequences. They're really transcription factor sequences. In this case, SV40 uh, viral transcription factor sequences that are added to a DNA molecule that can improve the, um, the uptake into the nucleus. This is actually an in vivo example, um, looking at plasmids with and without the DTS sequence for GFP expression. Um, in vasculature, and you can see much better GFP expression with the DTS containing plasmid. Now I say balanced because I think people have looked at this in a variety of different ways, and there's some counter, uh, countervailing views here. Um, this is a review of improvements in exogenous nuclear import um, that was published where you can see in the first sentence that attempts to improve the transport of DNA to the nucleus through the use of NLSs have thus achieved limited success. So it's a bit of a counterpoint to the work of Jean-Paul Baer. Um, and others have, have had seen, seen similar things. Here's an example of a publication where they were trying to repeat some of the DNA targeting sequences, the DTS elements, um, and found, you can see in their conclusion, no beneficial effects of DTS on gene expression or nuclear uptake were observed in this study. So I think it remains to be seen, and I, I think my own view on this topic is context is everything. I, I, saw, I read a nice review 
that talked about um, one potential confounder is these effects seem to be magnified in, in the cases where you're using weak promoter enhancer elements. But as soon as you move to strong promoter enhancer elements that are typically employed in gene, ther gene therapy applications, the benefits of these types of molecules tend to diminish. Um, so to be seen, I think a lot of the work has also been done in vitro with transfection. And so I think another cautionary point there is, are we seeing benefits due to transfection efficiency differences or true nuclear import differences? Um, but I, I call this out as an area to pay attention to. If you ask me like one of the um, ongoing areas of interest in non-viral DNA delivery is going to be um, continued development of solutions for nuclear access. Um, just a few words about um, maybe some of the advantages of being non-viral as well is you're not limited to the packing, packaging capacity of AAV. So in our hands, this allows us to use, uh, to really um, open up multiple opportunities by going to larger transgenes. We can ex improve the expression of existing gene cassettes. And the example I give here is factor eight. Going back to our example of factor eight, um, that was a, a that's a, a gene construct that to fit into an AAV capsid, you really have to use a very small promoter enhancer element because the cDNA really takes up the entire capacity, uh, 4.7 kb capacity of uh, AAV capsid. Our constructs in the non-viral world are routinely greater than 6 kb. So we break free of that limitation and it allows us to expand not only in the enhancer promoter regions, but also the untranslated regions um, that, that come into there. Um, there's a whole swath of cDNAs in the, in the world of um, gene therapy you might want to go after that are inherently too large to fit into AAV. I give an example of Stargardt disease in the retina where ABCA4 is, is much larger than, than the 4.7 kb. Um, also in the liver, Wilson disease is a similar type of, of cDNA that's larger than the capacity of AAV. Um, the third area is multiple transgenes. We've done experiments, for, for instance, where we've um, encoded heavy and light chain in a single transgene, uh, in a single cassette construct to, uh, to generate antibody secretion. So that's an interesting thing that you can start to do with, with larger capacity. You can also imagine uh, doing things like knockdown and replace. Alpha-1 antitrypsin is a, is a really complex disease where you actually have to knock down the dominant negative and then replace um, the, the native gene with the native alpha-1 antitrypsin. And you can imagine using this capacity to do, do both of those elements, right? Knock down through a hairpin generation and then separately express the, the full native protein. And then I think a field that's very interesting for the future is this idea of regulatable expression. So using large enhancer promoter regions that are responsive to physio physiological fluctuations. We've actually done some work here in vitro using things like TNF alpha responsive enhancer promoters to show that you can regulate expression based on the, the abundance of TNF alpha. So you can imagine a world, maybe it's a bit make believe now, but um, where you have an anti inflammatory gene therapy that actually responds to the inflammatory state of the body. So as TNF alpha levels rise, you increase the, the anti TNF. Uh, antibodies that you're generating. Something like that is, is, is a very interesting future area to, to pull into this space. Just to say a word on manufacturing, um, I mentioned Rob's work. We started with a cell-based system. Um, it took a lot of space. Um, you're doing a lot of bioreactors, uh, cell suspension bioreactors, and then harvesting what is ultimately a very small amount of DNA from those cells. Um, and it's very long, you see on the, on the right hand, it's a 28 day pro production cycle. We recognized early on that ultimately what we were getting from that system was a well-characterized DNA molecule. And there's lots of other ways to make DNA. So we spent a, a, a fair amount of time developing what we call RES, which stands for rapid enzymatic synthesis, which allows us to make enzymatically the DNA molecules or closed into DNA molecules in much smaller footprints. So what we what took a 500 liter bioreactor, we can do in 10 liter bioreactors now in a single day. And it produces much higher quality materials. So I'm showing in the middle, that's an actual ion exchange chromatogram of sedna drug substance that we routinely use. And it's beautifully pure. It's monomeric, beautiful, pure uh, drug substance. And so I think this is an element that both speeds our research and allows for envisioning 
scaling capacity to truly global scale to reach many, many patients beyond niche rare disease uh, Western applications. Um, one other word about um, some of the molecular biology we've done. We spent a lot of time thinking about how to optimize expression profile through the sum of all of the things you see here, enhancers, promoters, untranslated regions, leader sequences, of course, the open reading frame and codon optimization um, and intron inclusion. And we kind of tile that. You can imagine doing that in a very uh, systematic way across a lot of different um, regions and, and thinking about the combinatorial matrix of that. Starting and our screening pipeline really starts in vitro, can move into hydrodynamic in vivo injection for low quantity characterization, followed by LMP characterization. And what that led to as an example with factor eight is about a 30x increase with an optimized construct versus the wild type sequence. Um, and that's translated, as I said, into this point on the right where we can routinely get very therapeutically relevant expressions with an LMP delivered uh, sedna molecule encoding for factor eight in mice. It's a really nice ability to kind of optimize the gene cassette of interest as well. And that's where I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, I know as a company, we'll have a lot more to say. I hope I was able to kind of frame for you the opportunities and what we're playing for in the world of DNA delivery. Maybe the last thing to say on that front is the entire world of gene editing is in vivo is still obligated to AAV and viral delivery of donor template. And so this has massive applications in that space too. So if you wanna insert genes, large genes, you're gonna to have to deliver DNA. And I think we've, we view it as much more attractive to do that non-virally ultimately than be reliant on AAV. So that's the, the desired state of what we can bring for, forward from a, from a medical perspective. But I've also given you a flavor of what are the really significant scientific challenges that need to be overcome to make that a reality. Um, we feel like we're well on our way here at Generation Bio, and I know there's a lot of interest starting to um, come in uh, into this space as well. So I'm encouraged by that, that ability from and, and contribute into the space of non-viral DNA delivery. So with that, I'll wrap it up and uh, uh, in time for a little Q&A. Yeah, thanks, uh, Matt, for this uh, excellent presentation. I think it was a very uh, beautiful overview. So if you have a question for Matt, please use the Q&A function. And then I can start with a, with a few questions. So I think you, um, at the very beginning of your presentation, you mentioned the three challenges. So it's the immunity, delivery, and delivering delivery to the nucleus. So... I was thinking, and also listening to your whole story, um, is it not that everything depends on the delivery? Is it not the most important part of uh, of these three? Yeah, so Ronald, I think um, in the context of the inability to solve innate immunity at the cargo level, that's absolutely the case. I noticed there's a, a question from Art on the Q&A, so I'll come to that because I think it speaks to that a little bit. Um, we are very interested in solving innate immunity at the cargo level as well. Um, it's just that we viewed, certainly at the outset of our work, that that's a much higher bar uh, in the world of DNA than it was in the world of RNA. So we saw the Nobel Prize for the mRNA results of the modified urinane, uridine that took, that work from Drew and Katie really took its origins from tRNA modifications. Um, similarly, I think the two prime ribose modifications, I think I'm correct in saying this, had their origins in the siRNA space, bacterial types of modifications. So in the world of RNA, I think there were existing um, examples of the types of modifications that could solve at the cargo level innate immunity. We just weren't blessed with that kind of starting point in the world of DNA. And so we really focused on selective delivery as the way to open up therapeutic index in this space. So maybe I'll, if it's okay with you, I'll take um, Art's question because he- Yeah, I was, I was going to ask that, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just right on the heels of this question. So um, what Art asked is, can you reduce the interferon alpha induction of the Sedna using five methyl cytosine substitution at CPG motifs? Um, <clears throat> the answer is yes, but it's context dependent. So 
um, we did a we did a series of experiments in genetic mouse models, and the one we used was the um, it's a sting mutant model. So it's it's called a golden ticket mouse, and it basically eliminates the DNA innate immune signaling through the CGAS sting pathway, but leaves intact the TLR9 signaling pathway. And I know that's Art's area of expertise. But what's beautiful about that is in that model, if you either eliminate CPGs or methylate them to your point, Art, you can actually dampen the innate immune signaling interferon alpha, interferon alpha signal significantly. It doesn't do anything, doesn't do much to the um, inflammasome signal, unfortunately, so IL-18, IL-1-beta, but it does for interferon alpha. But unfortunately, when you go into a wild type uh, animal, I think the CGAS sting signaling is so dominant that the effects of CPG methylation are very muted. Um, and so that we did a lot of that characterization at the outset to Art's point, like, can we find chemical solutions? And I, I think the problem is the redundancy of the, some of the innate, innate signaling pathways that limit the ability to, to fully solve for that. So I hope that gets your question, Art. Um, I, hope it, I hope it does. Uh, so if not, I think uh, many of us will also be in Barcelona next week for the, uh, for the OTS. So I think it's okay to... Uh, to go to to uh, to approach you and, uh, and ask in person. Um, I, I, I think one of the uh, things that I find kind of interesting, and it's a question from uh, Ma, is um, uh, the way that you use the uh, the P form, so the more condensely packed uh, 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 LMP, so that they are smaller and more homogeneous. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah. Um, so. <clears throat> I think what we speculated with LMP formulation is you're really trying to take a rigid linear DNA molecule and compact that into a particle. And what you're relying on with the natural systems that we use is ionizable lipid phosphate interactions to condense that molecule. And we just wondered if there was um, somewhat of an energy or thermodynamic price to be paid to do that with a linear DNA molecule that could be different from mRNA or, or certainly from siRNA, which is very small. And what we hypothesized was that is, you know, we just wanted to understand, is there a way to create more compact or less rigid forms of DNA that were more amenable to creating small particles? And the literature we came up with was this, this work that shows that if you take a linear DNA or double-stranded DNA molecule and denature it and solubilize it effectively, salt-free solubilization in alcohol solvents, because you remove the water, the energetic barrier allows, now the, 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 the stable conformation is the phosphate-phosphate interaction, because there's no water molecules to hydrate the phosphates. They actually go internalized, and the nucleobases kind of go out. That's the denaturing. You can measure that through things like hyperchromicity by UV. You see the structural change. And you can actually look in the the like the images, right? So uh, atomic force microscopy or others, where you get this kind of condensed um, ver uh, uh, form of DNA. So we took advantage of that and said, if that's the starting point, a kind of pre-condensed form of DNA, would that be more amenable to smaller particles? And it turned out to be true. Now the nuance is, we're still driving. DNA particle lipid association through charge charge interactions. So I don't have the belief that we're that we're actually trapping that p form of DNA within the lipid nanoparticle. We're just creating a better starting point from a, a, a condensed monomeric form of the DNA that allows you to get smaller particles. But I'm sure that within those particles, because of how we're encapsulating them and what the driving force for that is, there's a reversion back to traditional B form DNA. Um, that's my guess. It's very, very hard thing scientifically to prove. But the one piece of evidence we have on that is you have to have low pH uh, buffer mixing to drive encapsulation. So if you create the P form DNA and you go in at neutral pH, the encapsulation efficiencies fall way off. So we know that there's a charge charge interaction for driving that, uh, that condensation, that particle formation. Yeah, yeah, I hope and, that, that helps. Yeah, I think it's, it's at least clear for me. Uh, uh, maybe to go a little bit further, I think uh, one of the things that you mentioned is it's important to design uh, 
active targeting ligands. And I think the idea of these active targeting ligands is that they are specific for a particular cell type. Right. For many disorders, or many disorders are like uh, multisystemic. So you actually do not want to target one specific cell population. So do you have any ideas how to treat uh, multisystemic disorders? Do we need to add like different targeting ligands? Do we need to add a mixture? Do we need to go for ligands that are specific for multiple cell types? What are your it's thoughts? It's a great question. This? I mean, the tongue in cheek answer is that right now is the domain of small molecules, right? I mean, so if you if you need to get into multiple cell populations, that's the way to go. Um, so, because I think this was a shared question across, you could say the same thing for siRNA or messenger RNA or anything, any other nucleic acid um, cargo, which is typically they're aimed at genetic diseases that are within a specific target cell population. So, if you look at the pipelines of, you know, nucleic acid therapeutics in general, that's how they're kind of carved out for that reason, right? I don't think we've yet got to the world where we can imagine creating um, particles that distribute to multiple cell types to treat a genetic disease. Um, but it's an interesting question. There are a number of genetic diseases we've looked at that have a liver manifestation and a CNS manifestation, right? And I think it's very hard to contemplate a single drug product today that can address both of those. But ultimately, I think if you get to a world where you have this type of modularity, you could imagine that. Now, there's lots of other questions in there, like physiological access to the tissue or cell type, which is with nanoparticles going to be limiting. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly possible, right? Um, but it's probably a bit further on the horizon. Um, so we still have, we only, we only have a few minutes. Uh, so maybe a few uh, quick and short answers to the questions in the chat. So first one, sure. um, uh, this must be a yes or no question. Uh, so uh, uh, you still do team mixing to form LMPs? Um, we do both. So we do, I mean, like many people, we use the microfluidic devices for small scale work. Um, but a lot of scaled work tends to move towards team mix type, type systems. Okay. Uh, Greg, uh, is the formation of the P-form sequence dependent? And can you form the P form with a circular plasmid DNA? Um, no, and yeah. So we don't. It's not sequence dependent. Sequence dependent, and um, at least in literature, not maybe in our hands, but you can you can form these P form structures with circular DNA. Yes. Okay. Uh, great summary, Matt from uh, Jogesh. Uh, could you share the data on the escape of DNA from the endosome compared to siRNA in LMPs? Yeah, I don't have the exact uh, quantitation, if you will, but our we believe the endosomal escape properties are quite comparable regardless of cargo. Uh, so I think that's really going to be dictated by the LMP. Um, in, in many cases, dictated by the ionizable lipid within the LMP. Um, so, so nothing, uh, I wouldn't view it from a space as like we're, we're fighting a different battle on endosomal escape than any other cargo. Yes, a quick question from Ross. Uh, what cell types do you think are amenable to knock in uh, via CRISPR-mediated ACR for an in vivo therapeutic? Outside my realm of expertise. So I think there's a lot of um, thoughts on like what types of cells are more amenable to, to HDR. I'm not an expert, so I won't venture an answer there, but I'll, I'll steer you toward my colleague and dear friend, Laura Seth Lorenzino, who's at Intelli. I'm sure she could take that question. Okay, uh, question from Ryan. It's a long question. Uh, let's read this. Uh, question about close end DNA and random integration rates and the risk of uh, internus, uh, mutagenesis, genotoxicity, recent publication in Nature Scientific Reports, high spontaneous integration rates of end modified linear DNAs upon mammalian cell transfection. Do you find this to be a risk given? the need to read those over and over versus a one-time uh, delivery? Boy, there's a lot in that question. Um, we do have some data on integration. I'm not going to talk about it. We haven't talked publicly about it. But the way I think about it is our molecule is very analogous to AAV with the inverted terminal repeats. And we believe the integration rate is going to be very similar to that. 
Now, the part about redosing is interesting because I actually think for AAV, you have to overdose um, significantly to get the therapeutic benefit because of capsid unpacking and other considerations. So I actually think the amount available, copies available for random integration events in our system is going to be ultimately lower and more specific on target. So we're not distributing like AAV to really every cell in the body um, with super high doses. We're, we're getting very specific delivery to the cells we care about at metered doses and not overshooting it. So I think that part stands in our benefit and lots yet to, yet to be learned about, about integration, but we don't think we're stepping into any inherently increased risk versus AAV for sure. Thanks. And then the last two questions, uh, if possible, very quick answers. Uh, question from Derry. Uh, any idea uh, how much ligand is loaded uh, onto the stealth LMP percentage-wise? Yeah, so I think in the Galnet case, we're typically in the, the 0.05 to 0.5 mole percent, depending, um, but in that range. And I think the example I gave for the SVFB it was actually 0.12 mole percent. Um, SCFB on the surface. So it's a, a, as a mole percent of total lipids. Okay. And the, the ligand modified uh, ion, ionizable lipid, the PEG lipid, or the formulated LMP? Yeah, the ligand's prototypically on the end of a PEG lipid. It can be another hydrophilic polymer, but typically on the end of the, the PEG lipid. Um, and in the case of um, uh, for, uh, protonation, it, it can either be included in a lipid that goes into the mix or post-conjugated. And there's a lot of work we've done on both of those, so. Cool, uh, then I think I give the word to Erin. Great, um, so that was an amazing talk, a really great question period. Um, I think it was, it was really, um, uh, it was beneficial to everyone. It was cool to see all the work that you're doing. Um, I just want to remind everyone that after the OTS, we are back um, before the end of the year with some of the poster winners to highlight their research, as well as some of the best paper um, award winners. And so with that, we just want to thank Matt again for such an amazing talk, um, and we hope to see you all at OTS.